Hi, I'm Cookie. And I'm Barry. And we're from Old Street Solutions. We build apps that make Jira and Confluence easier to use for all teams. Welcome to Boss Levels, a series to evaluate leaders from the present day, from history and leaders from popular fiction. We'll rate them on their success and their agility. Working in the Agile project management space, we have reporting tools with Jira that help team evaluate the success of their work every day. So this is an extremely useful exercise and an excuse to be nerdy, talking about some of our favorite heroes. And villains. Mm. Hello everyone, welcome to Boss Levels. Uh, my name's Chris Cook, CEO of Old Street Solutions. I'm Christopher Berry, I'm Head of Content here at Old Street. We make project management software, we're often talking to agile teams, so I thought it'd be fun for us to explore some various leaders throughout uh, history, discuss how good they were on various factors of leadership, including leading agile teams. We'll, we'll look at current and historical real leaders, but we might also look at some fictional ones and get that, ultra nerdy with it. That would be fun. So speaking of ultra nerdy, who are we talking about today, Christopher? We're talking about George Lucas. For those that have been living under a rock, <laughs> George Lucas is the director, producer, um, screenplay writer. Uh, he did almost everything uh, for the Star Wars films, right? He certainly masterminded the, the stories and the, the world. Okay, so I'm going to talk about why George was a good leader. Uh, the first major point is that he made Star Wars. Uh, this is the second highest grossing film franchise ever, fifth highest grossing media franchise ever. Uh, the combined box office revenue of the Star Wars films is over 10 billion US dollars. So, and the, the total value of the whole franchise was valued in 2020 at seven billion. Uh, it, it's not just about money, it's a massive pop culture thing. Uh, it, it brought science fiction into the mainstream and it was responsible for a, a sci-fi boom in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and also a boom in special effects. Uh, so, George wasn't just responsible for uh, Star Wars, a film franchise, he was also responsible for various companies. So Industrial Light and Magic, he founded, and uh, I know uh, a lot about Industrial Light and Magic from being a massive Star Trek fan, uh, because this company was responsible for a lot of the effects in, in most of the Star Trek films. Uh, oh, oh, well, so anytime these nerd fandoms are arguing, they're actually part of the same thing. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it, and it's not just the Star Trek films. I think uh, the Jurassic Park films were Industrial Light and Magic as well. I think they were responsible for a lot of TV series as well. It, I, I think a lot of the major uh, special effects um, in, in some of the biggest films can be traced back to George Lucas. So, and also Pixar. So the- What? Yeah. I, I think Pixar wasn't necessarily founded itself by George Lucas, but it was like an offshoot of uh, the graphics division of ILM. Uh, so, and that was created by George Lucas, and then that spun off and turned into Pixar. So technically, Pixar owes its existence to George Lucas as well. Oh wow, that's incredible. Um, your, your brain is really noisy there. <laughs> You is your microphone <laughs> on the side of the window or on the other side? It's, it's the roof, unfortunately, yeah. It, it's not soundproof at all. Fair enough. All right, we'll, get, we'll carry on regardless. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think it should be uh, removable post-production. We'll see. Hopefully. So I had no idea that uh, he was responsible for so many things. I, I was aware that he'd worked various times with... Um, that director fella. I was aware that he'd worked various times with Steven Spielberg. Um, oh yeah. Obviously, most famously on Indiana Jones. So uh, yeah, it's fascinating to hear how important George Lucas's companies were with special effects because mm. it's the main thing that's criticised um, often for the prequels is the overuse of special effects, right? 
certainly overuse of CGI. I, it, the, the, I mean, I, the, the, the problem I have with CGI is that it, do, it doesn't look good, but I do also appreciate that they were experimenting back there. It was the early days of, of CGI, yeah, and, so it's getting and, better it, all the time. It's a universal problem, isn't it? When you're pushing at the forefront of a new technology, uh, it ages pretty quickly. And, and yeah. it's really hard watching 15-year-old or older movies and watching the CGI. It definitely falls into the uncanny valley. And I think that's really unfair because at the time, it was the best CGI anyone had ever seen, right? So, Well, you say that, and, th and now I sound like I'm arguing against George, uh, but I, I never thought CGI looked good. The, th the thing is, when you can tell something is a cartoon in a shot, you, when you can tell it's not there, that, to me, is not good special effects. I actually, I think... Hopefully he, there's he, a photo of Jar Jar Binks behind me now. <laughs> yeah. That would be amazing. I, if, he, if he had relied less on CGI uh, during making the prequels and more on the practical effects and the puppetry he used for the original trilogy... It was we, Jim Henson's Muppets, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Uh, but they, but they were there. Like they, you couldn't do as much with them. You could, you can't move them as much. Obviously, there's there's limitations. But you know they're there. You know the actors aren't bouncing off nothing. Um, no. So, yeah, I think I think that was a that was a definitely a failing of the prequels. However, that was still those special effects in their infancy. And and CGI nowadays is massively improved. I just watched the. Tomorrow War the other day, which might well be uh, another movie that ILM is responsible for, uh, and that that had some CGI aliens in it, but it's getting to the point where you you really can't tell whether they are CGI or whether they are actually there and they're they're puppets or animatronics um, models. So and that's that's the. The legacy of, of, yeah. of the, yeah, the creative strivings of George Lucas, despite the fact that some, sometimes he succeeded and sometimes he failed. I think that, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I'll say off the bat, I'm a big fan of the movies. I, I think a lot of the hate is ridiculous. Um, it's often people forget that they're mostly child's films, and I, I don't mean that in, in a, an insult. Um, ob objectively, uh, the Ewoks are Muppets in space. <laughs> um, and and yeah, of course, and so much of it is, uh, yeah, like the, the excitement of space wizards and space cowboys mm. fight, fighting side by side. Um, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, let's drill down on you know whether he was a good leader, mm -hmm. um, and whether you think he showed agility in, in the way he ran his teams. I, I think there's there's, there's going to be two arguments here. Uh, was he a good leader when he was making the original trilogy, and was he a good leader when he was making the prequels? I think the original trilogy that's an example of of good leadership, um, and and good agility. Uh, as he was working through them and good collaborative skills. Let, uh, let's I, start down there before I start shitting on the sequels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so firstly, I think with the with the original trilogy, he made them with the technology that was available at the time. So going back to what we were talking about, the, the puppetry, um, the practical practical effects, the models. Um, he, he, he did want to do more with the material, but the tech had its limits. So he put out, I mean, this is controversial, but he would probably call the original trilogy that got to the theatres in the 70s and early 80s a minimum viable product. He, that's probably what he would call it. Um, because when the technology became available in the mid 90s, he then went back and he in, improved slash added to the product. Um, Again, also, controversial. Also controversial. <laughs> um, so yeah, so he, he, he put it out. That, that's a, that's a, a classic example of being agile. You, you put out something e even though it's not perfect. Um, he also was agile in the way he wrote the original trilogy because he didn't 
try to do it all himself. Writing is not his strong point, being kind, uh, and he was deferring to the writing expertise of others. So with the first movie, he, he was an unknown back then, um, and he was less confident, and he was still trying to make a name for himself, and he was still pitching to studios. So he, he did loads and loads of drafts of the script for the first movie, and he sent it out to friends to get their feedback. He made changes based on their feedback. He worked with some other screenwriter friends, uh, I think Gloria Katz and Willard Hike. Um, he brought them in to do the fourth draft. There's also lots of stories from the set about actors changing and ad-libbing their lines. I think Harrison Ford is, is famous for saying, um, George, you can type this shit, but you sure as hell can't say it. Uh, I, I also read that Lucas showed a draft of the opening crawl to some people, um, and they called it gibberish, uh, and they helped edit that, it. That was Brian De Palma from Scarface, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And then, of course, with with the Empire Strikes Back, which I mean, I don't, I don't think this, but it's commonly regarded as the best of the Star Wars films still today. George only wrote the story for that. He hired screenwriters to do the, the screenplay. And then with Return of the Jedi, he co-wrote it um, with Lawrence Kasdan. Interesting. So, so he, he was aware yeah. of his limitations. And, yeah. and, and obviously the first film didn't have a budget to outsource a lot of the work. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, as you say, worked with what he had and made it work when he could. And uh, cl clearly, you know, had some friends in Hollywood who were able to give him some pointers and tips as he went along the way. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, go on. The, well, the whole project for me uh, is the definition of this uh, like lean startup. Um, one of the most interesting things to me is how he raised money for it and how much he did on a shoestring budget mm -hmm. and how much he was able to do with like payment terms. And I think famously, uh, Harrison Ford, um, uh, part of the deal because he was struggling to pay actors, he offered them uh, equity in the film instead. And, Harrison Ford's ah. one of the people that took up that offer and got quite rich because of it. Was this for the original trilogy? Yeah, because ha yeah, Harrison, you know, like they're all underpaid, and and most of them were. This isn't uh, just Star Wars. I think a lot of films people work on at the time. You're never sure until you see it whether it's going to be any good or not. Famously, mm -hmm. uh, American Psycho. Only, none of the actors were in on the joke and they thought Christian mm. Bale's acting was terrible and they were like this is going to be the cheesiest fucking movie until they saw it they were like oh my god uh, same with Starship Troopers uh, the, mm. the director for that who uh, made Robocop as well he famously doesn't like his actors to be in on the irony of the, 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 the movie so uh, yeah, okay. I think everyone was a bit unsure how good Star Wars was going to be because it was always on a shoestring budget and mm. The effects would sometimes look a bit janky. It was the best they had at the time. Uh, and when they could afford to, they'd reshoot it. Uh, so it was a, a gamble and a half from Harrison Ford. Obviously, in hindsight, it seems very smart. But uh, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's funny to me that uh, Silicon Valley does exactly the same when you run out of f funding and can't afford to pay people. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you offer them equity in the company for a lesser pay, pay, paycheck instead. Did, didn't Harrison also get very rich off the, the, the first of the sequels? Because I'm sure he negotiated a, a, a share of the box office or something. I, I mean, when, you, when you're that big a name, I think you, you can do that. You've got quite a lot of clout in. I think Jack Nicholson is also one who's negotiated very good deals at the height of his fame. Fair enough, if, if you can do it. I, I famously, yeah. Keanu Reeves dropped his own pay so they could afford to pay uh, oh god why am I so bad at name dropping um, Al Pacino okay yeah yeah um, anyway we're, yeah. we're getting off off topic so uh, yeah as a you know executive producer I suppose mm -hmm. that role would be uh, I, I definitely concede that George um, did a lot with the limitations he had to make yeah. this thing happen against many, many difficult odds, right? He seems to have been very willing to work collaboratively on the original trilogy. He was letting a lot of people helping, help him. Um, and he was 
quite willing to listen to people. Um, and so, do you gonna, believe the? Do you believe the theory that uh, Star Wars was saved in the editing room? So I've heard this story that uh, people saw the first edit and went, oh my God, notably uh, George Lucas's then wife, uh, Marsha, is it, Lucas? Marsha, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so apparently she got some help. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard this version of the story. I, I mean, she, she definitely had quite a big impact. She, she's known for being one of the most influential voices for George and he, he did listen to her and she's I've heard responsible for uh, some of the more human moments of the of the yeah. original she's film. been described as the heart of the Star Wars series right yeah I mean I, I don't have like an exhaustive list of, uh, of of the things she contributed to I think she's responsible for uh, Leia kissing Luke before their big leap on the Death Star, um, Chewbacca and the um, the mouse droid that George was going to cut that out. She said to keep that in, and uh, she suggested killing off Obi Wan Kenobi as well. Um, George was going to keep him in the movie. I I, I haven't read anything else that she's responsible for. Um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't say that she saved. Star Wars because the material is all there in the movie and George Lucas I mean, is responsible for that material. Yeah, and movies are always made in the editing suite and it's not entirely surprising to me that the first draft of the edit had feedback and then it went back for more edits, yeah. right? Like, yeah, like, I, would, I, I would say the people that contributed to the script um, are probably more responsible than, than Marsha his ex-wife is in doing the edit apart from the suggestions she met she was obviously making suggestions while he was writing the script if he wasn't going to kill off obi-wan initially uh, and then he rewrote that part uh, and, and she's also f famous for um the moment when han decides to show up at the 11th hour in the millennium oh yeah moment. i did hear that yeah uh, yeah 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 so, but uh, rather than pin it on one person i think the point is it's clearly a collaborative effort and george managed to get a lot of smart people in the room and, and yeah. did listen to them, right? So yeah. that's probably a fairer summary of what happened. Um, any other closing thoughts in George's defence before I start ripping into the prequels? Well, I think going back to the, the companies he was running, uh, I've I read that he, he fostered a very collaborative environment at Lucasfilm and uh, Industrial Light and Magic. Um, there was collaboration across uh, divisions of ILM. The, the SFX division would, would work with the games division. Uh, and uh, employees' job descriptions were loose enough not to relegate them to specific silos. So they were free to move around and were assigned tasks based on the needs of s specific projects and their availability. So, um, so George was has shown quite a lot of flexibility yeah. uh, and, and a willingness to relinquish control um, with with a culture like this. He showed it, yeah. I think, I mean, look, if, if you consider George Lucas a serial entrepreneur, it's impressive how many success, massively successful businesses he's started, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's get into let's, it. So. Let's rip into him now, then. <laughs> I, I think... <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. Um, I think that every organisation that's a startup, uh, if it succeeds, grows big enough to no longer be agile and lose a lot of the magic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I would argue that the the, the prequels um, strongly suffer from this. There's a very different beast to having to ask your friends and your wife's opinion for help and. Uh, scrounging and being a scrappy little startup to being this huge conglomeration of corporate multi-million dollar corporations mm -hmm. uh, where you are the CEO and um, people I don't know I, I don't know whether you know he's this horrific dictator I think more like most creative types in Hollywood becomes an author and becomes looked up to and it becomes difficult to question them Right. Mm -hmm. yes. And also 
when you're building this huge behemoth multi-million dollar budget film it just becomes very slow to turn and move right it's, it takes so long so long to plan the thing and so long to move the thing that i think it's going to be quite easy to criticize how those processes cease to be agile and flexible and lean because that's how you run a small team on a small budget it's not how you run a behemoth battleship of a film studio have you seen the uh, the documentary uh, on the making of the phantom menace uh, I, think I have not uh, i think it was on the dvd and you you get you get quite a lot of insight into into the way george worked with people he's i certainly from that i certainly don't think he was a dictator or certainly anytime he was caught on film he, he didn't he didn't behave like that um and it seemed like his um colleagues uh and certainly the executive producer had a had a re they had good relationships with him um but as you say it might be that his status at that point the fact that he 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 was this very big name uh and he was responsible for for Star Wars, one of the biggest things ever. Uh, I, I suspect that the people working with him weren't as confident about challenging him on his ideas as they were back when he was making the original trilogy. So, so let's start, I think, episode one. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, the title screens, right, famous to start Star Wars. I, I think it's a great way of getting exposition out the way. Right, like yeah. especially if there's a gap between movies, yeah, I catches think genius, yeah, catches people up that didn't watch the last one, maybe, but you want to bring your yeah friend yeah. along to the cinema, um, yeah. At its best, it skips that exposition and just lands you in the film. And you were watching mm -hmm. adverts and trailers before anyway, so it gives you a bit of a moment to just soak in the anticipation and excitement of the movie yeah. that's about to begin. Uh, as soon as it starts scrolling up with. Uh, Something about a trade delegation and a trade tax, embargo, which yeah, famously, trade routes. Yeah. you know, kids love movies about trade <laughs> embargoes. It's <laughs> like it's just a really boring start. Mm. Like, yeah, um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know whether he he just wrote these these opening crawls for the prequels himself. I suppose because he he wrote uh, the films uh, entirely on his own, uh, from what I understand, and he. Um, didn't have lots of people adding their own ideas, so maybe the opening calls are just his work. Uh, I uh, I don't have the same issue as many people do with that that opening crawl for the Phantom Menace. You kind of you've got to start a story somewhere, and it's it, like this is this is going to be a a, a massive um, like it, we we start with a government that's going to get overthrown, t transformed into an empire, a, a dictatorship. It's got to start nicely and quietly with like s something slightly more low key as the threat. So and with the trade federation <laughs> and the and the um, the blockade, that's starting small. And yeah, less and to be fair, and being more generous, uh, I actually think George Lucas has a very interesting perspective, world building wise. Um, he couldn't say it at the time, but the first three movies, um, uh, it's quite clear to me that the evil empire is a metaphor for America, um, especially when you see like fighting in the jungle, mm. right? And the Ewoks representing the Viet Cong. Yeah. <laughs> um, there seems there seems to be a clear line to draw there, and it's an interesting one because every country thinks they're the goody, right? I'm sure yeah. some of the stormtroopers think that they were fighting on the right side against these evil terrorists, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think there was an interesting story to say about how does a government become corrupted and slides yeah. towards authoritarianism, um, but. I, I just think we could have had it stronger <laughs> had, it, had we not wasted so much time. Um, and here's the main two problems. Firstly, discussing the trade embargo, but then none of that seems to matter because we get lost in the pod racing. But mostly all of that falls apart because we don't have a, a protagonist. And th this is a, a, the fairest criticism I've heard of at least the first movie is that I guess Anakin should have been the protagonist, but instead we start off with Obi Wan, um, mm. and, and so and it's only about forty. Yeah, 
it's only about 40 minutes in that the protagonist, I guess, switches, but you're not really sure. And, and it's just flabby and weird and uh, disappointing. I mean, I, I I think if I think if the Phantom Menace is more of an ensemble piece anyway, I, it didn't really bother me that we didn't have a, a main protagonist. Lots of stories don't. You can have multiple protagonists and multiple characters you care about and follow different different ones at different times. Um, I didn't need Obi Wan to be elevated right to the top of the story. He has a, a he has a decent roles in the next two movies and, and we're sort of seeing... right so if you've got the patience to be like oh, 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 wait our next movie will be good we'll hear what's going on next movie i mean <laughs> i i i thought of qui-gon as the protagonist really um and i think that made his death have more impact even though i, was, I guess i was kind of expecting him to die at the end um but yeah i mean i you gotta love Liam, Liam neeson um, of course you, of course yeah. and uh, this is so I've heard the best thing a director can do is uh, it's all in who you cast, right? And, and that's such an important part of, of projects. And uh, this ties into one of the other criticisms of George Lucas is that he's not good at directing people, okay? Yeah. Um, so some of the best actors in Star Wars have, have loved him as a director. Uh, famously, Annie Gillis said, uh, oh, he's brilliant. He doesn't say anything. Gives no direction whatsoever. <laughs> That's perfect. And he's, he's Alec Guinness. Of course, he doesn't need it, right? Mm -hmm. um, Harrison Ford as well, I think, famously made fun of uh, George Lucas. He says, uh, yeah, his most popular direction will be to say, like, yeah, exactly like that, but better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, you it, and it, McGregor it, said exactly the same thing. So it's clearly... Something he does where, you know, he's not the best at bring, bringing things out of people. I mean, famously, I think it's the only bad performance in Natalie Portman's career. It's the only time her acting yeah. has been described as wooden ever. Yeah, she. I mean, she was very young. She was at the beginning of her career. So I yes, don't know. But if... I've seen her in three movies before Star Wars and it's perfection. So, mm. And he does like hiring young people as well. So... Again, another limitation. If he can't bring the best out of a young actor, then a, uh, someone else was needed there. It's uh, it's faster, more intense that George is famous for saying to his actors. I think <laughs> faster. The faster, same but better is how Harrison. Yeah. The same but better is how how Harrison yeah. Ford and Ewan McGregor have summarised it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, uh, and the performances in the, the prequels are not what the performances were in the original trilogy. And I don't know if that's the fault of George Lucas, if it's the fault of the actors themselves. The writing is probably a combination of, of all of it. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, Jake Lloyd, he hasn't gone on to do anything. He, he, he wasn't great in the movie. Um, and I, I think that was possibly him rather than George. Uh, he's, how old was he? <laughs> yeah. Like... What? Yeah, there's, there's lots of great child actors out there. I mean, it's probably the fault of George for casting not that great an actor. I, I don't think that's fair. Like, Henry Thomas was phenomenal in E.T. as Elliot. But did he go on and have a good career? How, how old was he? About the same age, I imagine. Nine, ten. But, yeah. And again, this is what I've heard as well, is that so George isn't good at realising something sucks in the moment. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. like a, a few people have, like, it's fine to, okay, you get a wooden, you got a wooden performance out of some of these actors. Um, a director's job is to, if not then, then in the editing room, go, shit, we need to reshoot this. And, uh, yeah. Especially, I think, after 25 years of not directing mm. movies, George wasn't capable of being like, this 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 scene should have been really shot because some I of mean, them are awkward to watch back even. I, I, sat, yeah. I sat through episode one and two recently and was, uh, yeah, just obviously this needs reshooting was what I thought about a couple of scenes. I was like, this, is, this was the best take? Wow. <laughs> and was it the acting you were noticing? Uh, yes, once I, I forgave the bad CGI. Um, mm. t 
two things I noticed, which a, a lot of movies struggle from this. Um, one was the acting. The second thing is just the obvious racism. <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, every alien is like, which racial stereotype will this alien be? <laughs> yeah. Like, let's open with some Chinese diplomats. And then we're going to have, I guess, a Jamaican Jar Jar. Yeah. And then I the mean, pod racing, a very Jewish, yeah. a very Jewish slave master who they're negotiating with. It's like, wow, wow. <laughs> I mean, I've I've read all these things, but as a kid, I didn't I didn't notice any of this. Yeah, George isn't a kid, though. So <laughs> so no, true. He doesn't have any of that excuse. <laughs> and this, you know, someone should have been like, hey. Because apparently the actors on the film did think this. I've heard in interviews since they were like, oh, that's a bit troubling. And, and again, I, I don't know if that's George's fault. But the fact that, you know, once, once you're the head of a multi-million dollar corporation, mm -hmm. uh, especially back then, no one put their hand up and went, no isn't this it. terrible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and I'm glad that people are doing that more and more now, questioning things. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the biggest weaknesses of... The prequel trilogy. Uh, it's, it's more so the more so the first two. I would say Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones is the dialogue and the, and the over reliance on on CGI. The dialogue was very poor in places, and no amount of reshoots was going to fix that unless unless the dialogue was ad libbed by the actors, and that that just wasn't happening. I don't think. It's just um, unforgivable for me, um, you know, because some of the source material, right, especially, you know, after the first three films were made, 25 years of people writing f from fan fiction to official mm. canon books, incredible books. Like, I recommended one to you the other day. Um, yeah. Really well-written books. And, and, and so there's just this back catalogue of content here um, mm. that, that was written about the same things before yeah. the films came out uh, and for me just the saddest moment in the whole series is when Darth Vader becomes Darth Vader for the first time and all all the script says is no <laughs> and I can just see George yeah. on an old fashioned typewriter a few more O's oh, eight more O's uh, yes nailed it next scene I'm like what yeah I mean, I don't know how. Yeah, that that that's one of those moments that George really should have. Re like, yeah, he he doesn't have. He he can't tell when something is is rubbish, um, and I, I mean, he really should have been able to tell that that moment should never have made it into the film. Um, Thank you so much. I needed to vent and rant about everything that frustrated <laughs> me with the prequels, mostly because they were disappointing. And they were mostly disappointing because I was, like a lot of people, so excited for them. He, he really does have a, a phenomenal talent for world building, uh, as an executive producer, as a founder of these companies. Um, but like so many startups once they get above a certain size i think there's a lesson to us all beware of the loss of agility the loss of yeah. lean practices the the loss of listening to feedback from others yeah um and yeah the, the, and not necessarily because the people at the top are scary dictators but because it just becomes harder and harder to punch through the hierarchy um, yeah and, and the levels of bureaucracy involved in such a big project I think this. I, I think the the biggest strength of the the prequels um, is still George's creativity. I think the failing is that, like, he he's a very creative person. He's got great ideas, but not every idea he comes up with is great. And that's where you need input from other people to temper some of those bad ideas and and cut out things that really really shouldn't be there. Uh, that didn't happen with the, the prequels. But for me, the prequels are miles ahead of the sequels because George told a new story with new characters. He went in completely different directions to the original trilogy, whereas the sequel trilogy went in exactly the same direction as the original trilogy. Oh, they're just, they're not sequels, they're remakes, in they're my, remakes to my mind. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's, and I just imagine an organisation evil enough to be like, 
you remember that Death Star with the exhaust port that blew up? Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know how it got blown up? Yeah. Why, what were you thinking? Let's make it again. Let's do it again, <laughs> Chief. <laughs> yeah. It was, what it could was, go wrong? <laughs> it was a hot, I mean, people have pointed out fan service in the prequels, but the sequels were 100% fan service. There wasn't anything original or creative in those movies at all. Yeah, they the, the sequels really success. were a cash cow. It was just yeah. a remake. Um, I, I do very much like the spin-off movies, though. Uh, for anyone that the sequels yeah. uh, turn them off to watching them, I'd really recommend uh, Han and uh, Rogue One. Is that a spin-off? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the first of them. And I'm very excited um, for Rogue Squadron coming out. But that's half of the excitement of these movies is the hype, and then just hoping you don't get disappointed. Yeah. Again. I mean, I don't, I don't know who to blame for the the, the sequels because you can't blame George, obviously, because he wasn't he wasn't involved. They took his he, ideas. He, oh, he was and very upset them. that he yeah, wasn't they, involved. They, yeah, they, yeah. It, to be honest, if they'd taken his stories, um, and I don't know all the details of, of what the sequels were going to be about, if they'd follow his followed his ideas, um, but they probably would have been a lot better. Just just based on. The prequels, the fact that the prequels were so different, I feel like the sequels could have been a lot better if they were at least, if George was at least doing the stories. Maybe the, if the movies had different screenwriters, different directors, fine, but he should have at least been producing and writing the stories and obviously he wasn't involved at all. Um, but I don't, I don't know if Disney are to blame. Uh, I don't know if J.J. Abrams is to blame. Pro well, it's probably a again, this is... But this is what I was talking about earlier. Once it gets to a huge mega corporation, yeah, it, there is diffusion of responsibility, and it doesn't matter because everyone's on a thing that has so much momentum. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think any one person could save that project. It was just a uh, like I've heard many a director say that if a movie comes out and is good, it's an accident of the entertainment yeah. industrial complex. Like it somehow escaped through the cogs of that horrible machine. Yeah. <laughs> And in a world where we're now watching the sixth and seventh sequels of movies, um, yeah, like this is why everyone looks to startups and the wisdom of these scrappy little startups. Because once a thing becomes that, it's just a non unstoppable behemoth. And, and there is, same with a big corporation, no, no one to blame. The fusion of responsibility, yeah, you know, it, it, it's out of at people's hands, and there's no one person responsible for anything, really. Yeah. That said, I, 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 I'm not anti-Disney in, in when, when I talk about Star Wars. Yes, the, pre, the, the sequels were dreadful uh, and I hate them. However, the fact that they are really pouring a lot of money into the franchise and wanting to create more properties in that. Yeah, you could think that that's a, a money spinner. But we've got The Mandalorian out of that. Absolutely brilliant series. I haven't um, started watching The Book of Boba Fett yet, but I am excited about that. There's going to be it's another right. series set 200 years before The Phantom Menace or something, which sounds really interesting. Um, and also the, the, um, the spin-off films. Um, yeah, so Rogue One and Solo. I quite like Solo. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, great film. You, you wouldn't have any of those if um, Disney hadn't bought the company. So, um, yeah. So I'm uh, I mean, to yeah, that. like a lot of huge corporations, it will spit out an occasional good product and uh, some mm. bad. So let's tie it all together. In summary, George Lucas, how would you score him on various so we can compare him with other leaders? Well, I think it's, it's difficult because I think, I think we should score him differently in different decades. <laughs> all right. So I, I think, you know, if we're talking about Genghis Khan, we're talking about him at the height of his career. If we're going to talk about anyone, that's where we should judge him by. So let's... So the height, by the height peak, of his yeah peak George how, the how height of his career George? would be the pre when he was making the prequels wouldn't it yeah, yeah so actually good, actually I I'd probably so if it's out of ten probably score him okay I'm a bit massive fan of the prequels so I'm gonna score him six six for what I think we should score him on agility creativity okay. and leadership okay well creativity I would score him. Eight. Uh, fair enough, yeah. Agility, I'd score him four. <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> His team was agile, but George himself, not so much. Yeah. 
and the leadership. Um, I would say six because cool. I think the I think the prequels were successful um, in lots of ways and unsuccessful in other ways, but they reignited the franchise. They continued the story they he's founded four plus successful companies that have produced amazing things yes yeah all right thank you very much uh anything else to say any closing I, thoughts are you going to offer your scores because your scores are probably different to mine i'll, I'll take yours mate That's <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> uh so from boss levels i'm chris and i'm christopher Thank you very much, guys. If you uh, disagree with anything we've said, uh, I don't need to encourage you. I Just check out the comments. I bet they're a mess right now. So ap apologies. <laughs> Star Wars fans get very passionate. 